All right, there's my official start. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Nature Connection Lunch and Learn series. Um, we're very excited um, to be here with you today. Um, and you get to stick with me the whole time because um, I'm going to be doing our presentation today about our new stream monitoring program that we are starting um, at Bucks Audubon. So um, we're really, really excited about that. Before I get started, just a reminder, um, definitely come out if you have an opportunity. It's a beautiful time of year to come out to Bucks Audubon. There's so much in bloom, so much activity, so many birds. We were out on a bird walk um, with Diane actually just on Monday and we saw a beautiful Orioles nest. Um, so lots of great things going on. So definitely if you have the time, come out, take a walk um, and enjoy and enjoy the property. Um, all righty, I'm going to share my screen and then get us started all about stream monitoring. All righty. There we go. All righty. So as I said, this is our Nature Connections um, Lunch and Learn series. Um, we have two more weeks coming up. Um, next week on May 19th is all going to be about the North American butterfly count that happens in July. Um, Bowman's Hill um, Wildflower Preserve is actually the um, the main group in our area that helps to organize it. So they'll be doing the presentation next week, which should be very exciting. Um, and then on May 26 will be our last one um, for the spring. Um, and that one is going to be all about um, Firefly Watch. Um, Heidi Shiver, one of our um, community, um, community science members, um, loves this program and is excited to do that presentation for us. Um, we are going to take a break for the Lunch and Learn series over the summer. Um, and as long as people are still interested, um, hopefully we'll bring them back um, in the fall again. So it should be lots of fun. So today we are going to be talking a lot about water. So water, watersheds, and how that all impacts our stream health. Um, water is a really big topic that we talk about at, at Bucks Audubon because we are located in the Honey Hollow watershed. And in the in 1980s, Honey, um, Bucks County Audubon Society actually merged with the Honey Hollow Watershed Association. Um, they, they formed together to create the Honey Hollow Environmental Education Center, where our property is and, and, the, and the work that we do there. Um, and then the organizations merged. So people get that confused sometimes. So it's all one organization, Bucks County Audubon Society um, is the official name, um, but we often refer to it at Honey Hollow because of our location. So watersheds and water are a huge part of what we do because we have a really rich history in that. Um, but they're also a really important thing, even when we're talking about birds, as a connector because water connects us all. We all need it. All living things need water. We need it to have clean water. Um, and the water that's here is not just here. It's, you know, it's constantly moving through the water cycle. Um, when we teach kids about water, I love talking about the fact that the water, there's only so much water on the earth and it just gets constantly recycled. It's the perfect recycling program. Um, and so the dinosaurs were drinking the same water that we're drinking today, um, which always makes kids, um, kids giggle which I love to do. Um, so, so thinking about water is, you know, it's a constant thing that's here, but we all need it. It's important. And what's happening to water on our site impacts things way further downstream. So when we think about the watersheds, we are located in the Delaware River Basin, the Del Delaware River watershed. So which makes up parts of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, all leading. Um, so all of our streams in this area ultimately are going to flow into and contribute their water to the Delaware River and the Delaware Bay, the Atlantic Ocean. So that is our watershed. But we can also look at it in a little smaller way and talk about the fact that even though we're in the Honey Hollow watershed, Honey Hollow is a tributary of the Aquatung um, Creek. So the Aquatung Watershed Association, if anyone's familiar in our area with them, they're great people. Um, they do some really wonderful things around the Aquatung and Honey Hollow is a branch where we a tributary um, to that. The Aquatung Creek then feeds into the Delaware River directly um, near the Playhouse um, right in New Hope. So, so this is sort of a, a brief picture of that. Um, so if you're looking at the map, we're sort of in that left corner. Um, you'll see the Honey Hollow branch um, and you'll see um, a stream node there, stream node A. That's actually just onto our property um, coming across Route 263, Upper York Road. There's a couple small streams that come in and form um, into our branch of the Honey Hollow that runs through our property. So just to sort of orient people to sort of where we are. So. So then when we talk about the Honey Hollow watershed, we always have to talk a little bit about the history of it because it has a really 
interesting rich history. In the 1930s, basically the farmers in the area and in the watershed decided there were some problems. They were noticing problems with erosion. They were noticing that their water quality was going down because of too much soil in the water. And they were noticing that there were just a lot of problems that they wanted to figure out how they could solve. Um, and this was not a, a problem that was, you know, not known by people. Um, in fact, around the same time, they were forming the Soil Conservation Service um, in, the national, in the federal government um, to sort of help um, sort of help with some of these soil erosion issues that were happening. Um, so the, uh, um, the farmers in the Honey Hollow watershed worked with the Soil Conservation Service to create the, a watershed conservation plan for the area. And they piloted a lot of sustainable agricultural practices. And a lot of these are honestly still best practices today. When you think about contour farming, um, having field breaks, um, having vegetation edges, things like that. Um, those are still things that are encouraged in farming today. They don't always happen, but they are encouraged as sort of best management practices today. So because we were sort of the pilot and sort of first um, doing a lot of this in 1969, um, the Honey Hollow watershed was named a National Historic Landmark um, for the work that, um, that was happening. If you're interested in that history, and there is a lot of really cool stuff involved there, and I just glossed over it really briefly, um, there's a lot of places on our property um, where you can see more information. We've got some signage outside. We have a full exhibit inside the, um, the Education Center on the wall. You can also, the story of Honey Hollow, um, you can actually find it and download um, the, a PDF of it. It's a really fascinating book that talks a lot about what was happening at that time as well. So lots of great history um, about the watershed. So, so as we think about the watershed and we think about our stream and how it impacts obviously our local watershed and then the bigger wider region watershed, we wanna think about how is that going to, what, what are we contributing? What are we contributing to, um, to that bigger watershed? So that's why we wanted to start and do more stream monitoring. Um, Street monitoring can come in, in a couple different forms and we're going to talk about that, but um, we do a little bit of this with when we work with the kids sometimes um, and sort of talk about it with them and talk about water quality and how to determine it. Um, but we don't really keep really close records and compare on different parts of the site how things um, how the water quality of our stream is. So this program is going to actually look at some different parts of the property and, and do some comparison as well. So we're going to be looking at a spot thick where the water just first comes onto our property. So what's the quality of it when it's just coming to us? You know, and then we're going to look at the stream quality in an area where that we use a lot with the kids for, for looking for macroinvertebrates and just playing sometimes because who doesn't love to play in the stream, especially in the summertime. Um, so we're gonna look there. We also have a pond on our property and we're gonna talk a little bit later about some of the things that that pond can sort of impact in our water quality. So we wanna look at water before the pond um, water in the stream before the pond and then water in the stream after the pond. So we have um, four sites that we're going to be monitoring on our property to sort of compare them and see how they're different within our just within our property and then sort of how that water is then going to go into the larger watershed. So, so that's why we want to do it. So it's some personal things for us, but then also um, as part of our community science committee, we really want to find projects that will be, we'll be able to share the data that we're collecting and put, make it available to sort of the wider audience. So uh, all of our stream data is going to be going into a database that's being collected by the Isaac Walton League. And I've got their information later on in this as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're excited to be able to do that. So, so the rest of this is sort of what we're going to be monitoring um, about our streams. So when we think about stream monitoring, I like to think of sort of, it's a sort of a three prong piece. Not everybody looks at it this way. Some people just say, oh, it's all about the chemical testing or some people say it's all about the macro invertebrates. I think they're all important, but I think the very first thing that when you're doing any kind of stream monitoring is to do some kind of just a visual assessment of the area. You know, it's not just about the water, it's about what's happening on the banks of the stream. So there's a lot of different things to, to look at. So, so we're gonna have sort of three steps. So a visual assessment, we're gonna do chemical testing, and then we're also gonna look at, the, um, at what's living in the water, our macroinvertebrate survey. So when we're looking at a stream and doing a visual assessment, um, and it's not just visual, we like to smell as well. Um, we want to look at a variety of different things. So we want to look at the vegetation that's sort of in and around our stream. So if you're thinking about a stream, a stream is moving water. 
there's typically, if it's, if it's moving and it's healthy, there's typically not vegetation growing in the water. So you're not seeing a lot of algae. You're not seeing a ton of um, duckweed or, or anything like that that's growing in the water because it's moving a little too quickly. Um, so if you have those things, those can sometimes be an indication that there's a, there might be a problem. So we want to look at the vegetation. We want to look at the vegetation that's growing on the sides. Is it healthy? Is there a lot of it? Um, so we want to look at that. We also want to look at what kind of vegetation it is. Is it just grass and then there's a lot of sun? Is it very open? Is it, is it tree cover that's shading the stream? Um, because those can really impact some of the chemicals and things that we're going to talk about um, a little later here. So you want to look at that as well. So you really want to look at the vegetation. You want to look for erosion. This is a huge problem right now. Um, as we get more and more strong storms through climate change, more and more water is coming and going down these uh, and down our streams and it's eroding the sides of the streams um, and we get more sediment which can cause a lot of problems in our streams. So you want to look for that erosion. Um, and then you want to look at the water itself. You know, we all know what nice, clear, beautiful water looks like. We want to look for the color of our water. You can see in some of my pictures here, those are not colors that you want. Um, <laughs> you, you don't want them to be sort of murky and, and weird looking. You don't want there to be foams and films on it. Like that top picture has sort of an oil slick on it. Um, you don't want there to be litter in the water. Um, you don't want the water to smell bad. Um, but then you also want to think about, you know, how has it changed since your last visit? Since we're going to be monitoring on a monthly basis with this program, that's going to be an important one. Does it look different than it did the last time they were there? And then why might it look different? And was there a really heavy storm? Are we in the growing season so the plants have really grown up? Um, has the temperature went up so maybe there's more algae in the stream? Um, so understanding the changes from time to time and how it looks different um, is part of that visual assessment. So if we look at this stream um, and do a quick visual assessment, um, we've got lots of great trees and lots of plants growing along the side. Um, it's not the greatest picture. It looks like the water's green. I'm pretty sure the water is crystal clear and beautiful. Um, so, so this is probably a healthier stream. You want your streams to have some good cover, some good vegetation around them. Um, we can't smell it, but it probably smells lovely. Um, whereas something like this, maybe not so much. You can see a lot of the vegetation has been sort of beat down. There's not any trees, there's not any cover. So the water's probably a lot warmer. Um, you can see there's a lot of erosion on this stream bank. Um, so this one's probably not as healthy of a stream. So, and we can tell those things just by looking at, just by doing that sort of visual assessment. So after the visual assessment, we can go and delve a little bit deeper into the things that we can't necessarily just see from looking at it. Uh, and that's where some of the chemical testing comes in. Um, so this is going to tap into everybody's, you know, high school or college chemistry if you took it. Um, Diane is on here, so which makes me a little bit nervous because her background is chemistry and I'm probably going to mess something up here. Um, and I'm sure she'll tell me if I do. Um, but, but when we're thinking about um, sort of the chemical testing in the stream, there's a lot of things that we want to be sort of within certain ranges um, and things that we want for the, for the overall health. Um, one thing that we definitely want to make sure that we're looking at is the pH. And if you remember back um, again to that chemistry lesson, um, pH is a scale from, from zero to 14 or one to 14 that decides whether you have acids or bases. Seven is neutral. That's where your water usually is. And water in a stream can be slightly above or slightly below seven. Um, and sometimes that's dependent on the kind of rocks um, that, you're, you might, that might be going through, that the stream might be going through, um, or for other factors. But you want it to be pretty close um, to seven, pretty close to neutral. If it's too high or too low, then that's an indication that something's not quite right. So pH is an important one that we're going to be looking at. Um, a really, really important one we're going to look at is dissolved oxygen. Um, and this is how much oxygen there is in the water. And this is going to be impacted by different things. This is going to be impacted by temperature. So if we look at the bottom figure I have here, um, typically what happens is if you have sort of faster moving streams, so you've got some speed going there. Um, you have streams that are going to have a lot of rocks in them, so you get sort of ripples in the water, which are turning up the water. Um, and if the water is sort of shaded, so the temperature is lower, you're going to have a higher dissolved oxygen level. So what tends to happen, and what we're expecting to see when we, when we look at this, is that the areas of our stream that 
that have all those things that have good vegetation that have all the rocks and ripples and are going at a nice speed and the lower temperatures are going to have a higher dissolved oxygen and then we have a pond which is sort of what you're seeing here where the water slows down um, it's a little bit more stagnant it's not completely shaded we're expecting there the temperatures to be a little bit higher and our dissolved oxygen levels to be a little bit lower um, what we're really interested to see is if once the water leaves the pond, if those dissolved oxygen levels go back up, once it gets back into a shaded area, once we have more rocks, once it speeds up, once the temperature cools down, if those dissolved oxygen levels go back up. Um, and this is really important because this will indicate and, and sort of impact what kind of animals are going to live in our stream. So that higher dissolved oxygen is going to bring in more animals. This chart with the with the fish on it is actually from the Chesapeake Bay, um, but it's one of those things I just want everyone to think about. If there's not water, if there's not oxygen in the water, very very few things are going to be able to live there. Um, but the more oxygen gives you a lot more diversity of of animals that can live in the water. Um, we're also going to look at some nutrients. Um, we're going to look at phosphates and nitrates. Um, and phosphates and nitrates are really important in our soil. They're really important for plant growth, but they can be a really big problem when they um, get into the water. These are not nutrients that are necessarily supposed to be in the water, and they will often get into our water um, because of runoff. So if you think about your watershed, you have your streams or in your valleys, and then you have all the land around them. So when it rains, some of that water is absorbed down into the ground and goes into you know, the groundwater. Some of it is on the surface and if it rains really heavy, it's gonna run off and into our streams. And when it runs off into streams, it's going to pick up pretty much anything that's on, that's on the ground and sort of take it with it. Um, this is why, you know, when you see sort of the flooding from some of these bigger storms, it picks up a lot of sediment, it picks up a lot of trash, you know, it picks up whatever sort of on the ground. Um, and that includes Unfortunately, sometimes fertilizers. This can be a huge problem, especially around um, like farming areas that are using a lot of fertilizers um, or pesticides or anything like that on their um, crops. All of that can get picked up and washed away. Animal waste, um, too much decomposing material. In a healthy stream, you wanna have some, um, some leaves falling into it because they, they provide a good food base for um, for the animals that are living there, but you don't want to have too much because if you have too much decaying material, um, it, knocks you, it knocks everything out of balance. Um, so you don't want too much decomposing material, um, which will bring in those nitrogens, nitrates and phosphates as well. Um, and some different household source, sources, some of your like cleaning things. Um, so if you think about things like, um, if you decide to go outside and you know it's a beautiful day and you want to wash your car, it's really important to think about where you're washing your car because if you're washing your car on the grass where it's gonna get absorbed and everything, that's fine, the soaps aren't gonna be a problem. Um, but some soaps and detergents have things in them that we don't necessarily want into the water. And if you're washing it on the street where the water is gonna run into a storm drain that's gonna dump it into a stream, those phosphates and things in your detergents can then become a problem in the water. So there are lots of different sources for these things um, that we wanna think about. And a lot of it can be fixed just by thinking about what's on the edges of our streams. Um, a big project that we've been doing um, at Bucks Audubon for the last couple of years is working on our riparian buffer zones, um, which is the, the plantings along the edge. And remember we said vegetation along the edge of our stream is really important because it not only helps shade it and keep it cooler, but it also filters out a lot of those things. If, it can, if those vegetation can slow down the water so it doesn't move as fast, then a lot of those things can actually be sort of filtered out and absorbed um, and soak in, back into the soil where they're a good thing instead of getting into the water where they're a problem. So, so that's why we do that. Another reason we do that visual assessment is are there enough plants along the side to be able to sort of filter out the things that help keep the things that we don't necessarily want um, out of the water. Um, phosphates and nitrates, as I said, are really good also for plant growth. So they can cause plants, um, especially like algae, to grow in the water where we don't necessarily want it in streams. So that's what you're seeing down. This is actually a river um, at the bottom. Um, but if, especially in the summer when it gets hot, this is when it can be a, an extra problem. Temperature, again, it's a huge one. Um, so these are algae blooms, duckweed, all of those things you know, that are growing there often is because there's too many phosphates and nitrates in the water. So it's encouraging that plant growth, which then creates a lot of different problems. 
Alrighty. And I've mentioned temperature a couple of times. And it really is important. You know, like here you, it sort of shows you there are different types of fish that won't live where it's too hot. So if we want a more diversity of, of wildlife, then we definitely want to keep the temperatures cooler. Um, but temperatures, as we said, impact dissolved oxygen. They impact the plant growth. So keeping the, the water cooler is, is really, really important. So we'll definitely make sure that we're testing the temperature. And as I mentioned before, we have that pond on our property. So the water coming into our pond is gonna be cooler than the water in the pond. So we wanna keep a close eye on how the water going in and how the water going out compare to each other. Does it cool back down after it's coming out or does it stay warmer? Um, so lots, lots of things to sort of think about and a lot of them revolve around sort of that temperature. Um, and then we also look at turbidity. I love this word. It's a great word. So essentially we're looking at how clear is our water? You know, is it crystal clear? We can see through it perfectly or is it sort of mucky and murky? How much sediment is, is up in the water? Um, we do it, um, this sort of black and white disc that you're seeing here is called a secchi disc. Um, and that is a way of sort of judging how much turbidity is in our water. We're not gonna use one just like this. Um, when you're looking at streams, the water's not that deep, um, but we actually will use a column where we fill it up and then we'll sort of judge how, um, how much sediment is in our water. Um, this is important because there's a lot of things that are in our, in our streams when we talk about those macroinvertebrates that have, they have gills, um, small fish have, have gills, things that are growing in the water. And if there's too much sediment in the water, then it gets stuck in gills and it makes it unhealthy for a lot of the animals that are living there. So, so we wanna, you know, so turbidity is a really good way of judging whether our stream is healthy or not. Um, and as I mentioned, earlier, the, um, in our areas, we get all these bigger storms. One of the major problems we're getting is um, too much sediment in our streams. A lot of it's settling out and it's on the, um, on the floor of our streams, which is not necessarily a good thing for it because a lot of the macroinvertebrates are want to live down there and they don't want to live there if it's, you know, very sediment heavy. Um, but, but during different times, especially if there's been storms, the turbidity level in our stream will go way up. All righty. So that's the chemical stuff. Hopefully I didn't mess it up too badly. <laughs> Alrighty, now the fun part, at least I think the fun part, because I think they're cool. Um, and that is looking at um, the macroinvertebrates. So a macroinvertebrate, just because I like words, a macro, so it's something that you can see. So these are your mostly insects, although there are a few that aren't insects. Um, and then they, um, so, but they're big enough that you can see these aren't, you don't need microscopes to see these. You can see them um, with the naked eye and then invertebrates. So these are ones that don't have any kind of backbone. There are a lot of other things that live in the stream as well that can help us to sort of judge whether or not it's healthy. I know in our stream, we get a lot of salamanders. We get a lot of frogs. Um, and so amphibians are, are a good sign that our, that our water's um, pretty clean. Um, we might see some small fish, um, but, but those things are, are, are things that we look at and, and acknowledge that, yes, these are really cool that we found them. Um, but when we sort of look at the overall health, they typically do a, a score on the health um, based on these macroinvertebrates. And what they look at is their pollution tolerance scale. So there are three groups of macroinvertebrates and based on sort of how sensitive they are to, um, to pollution in the water. Um, when I explain this to kids, I, I tend to explain it as, okay, everyone think of your room. You know, is your room super, super organized and clean and, and perfect and everything in its place? And you have to have it that way because you can't possibly live with it any other way than that. Then you would be in that sort of pollution sensitive group. So you, you can't have things that are messed up. And then there's a group of sort of in between, you know, I'm sorry, then you have your group threes. Those are the ones that they can live with a complete and total mess. And that's okay. They're more than happy with that. They can live where it's clean, but they can also live with it where it's a mess. And then you always have that middle group. So the group two, they can tolerate some problems, but not, not a lot. So, so when we think about that, um, when we go to the stream, we're gonna collect the macroinvertebrates that we find there um, and sort of look at them based on their groups. Um, and then there's a scoring mechanism that we're gonna use. Um, but we're gonna look at them based on those groups to be able to tell us what, what's living in our stream and that'll tell us how healthy our stream is. 
Now, the thing that is always important to remember, and I'll probably say this more than once, um, is that just because an animal is a group three, doesn't mean that it's not gonna live in a clean stream. It's more than happy to live in a clean stream, but it can live in a dirty stream. Whereas animals in group one, they cannot live in a dirty stream. They can only live in clean streams. So, so there's something to think about there. Alrighty. So, so group one, these are our sensitive, these are our sensitive bugs. Um, and some of them are probably ones that you've heard of before. Um, a lot of our macroinvertebrates are actually the larval stages of, um, of insects. And many of them spend much longer as the larval stage in the water than they do as an adult. Like when we think about our mayflies, which are a whole group of, um, a whole group of macroinvertebrates, these are all larvae. Once they can spend, I believe, up to two years in the stream growing and eating and, and being happy there. Um, and then once they emerge as adults and finish their metamorphosis, they only live for about three days. Hold on, I have to get out of my zoom. <laughs> they can only live for about three days. So they actually will, um, they won't eat. They emerge as adults, they mate, they lay eggs and they die. That is, that is their whole adult um, job. Um, so most of their life cycle is spent in the water um, in that larval stage. And, that, and that's true for a lot of um, a lot of the different um, macroinvertebrates that live in the water. Um, so in this group one, the ones that are a little more sensitive, again, we have sort of those mayflies. Um, we have stoneflies, which are, I think, really cool looking. We'll look at some pictures of them in a minute. Um, we have caddisflies, and caddisflies are super neat. So in this picture here, you have the actual caddisflies, but then you have these little structures. They actually a lot of the animals that live in the water, they have to think about that moving water. So they tend to hide under rocks or attach themselves to rocks um, or live in spots that are just a little bit more protected from the, the water that's moving quickly. Caddisflies take it to a whole nother level. Instead of just sort of, you know, holding on to the rocks, they actually build structures around themselves using small stones or small sticks or leaf litter or whatever is around them. And they sort of make these little um, caves for themselves to hide into so that they don't wash away. So, so they're really, really cool. So if you pick up a rock in a stream and you see like a little cluster of rocks sort of stuck to it, chances are that either is, because it might still be in there or it was um, a little home of a caddis fly. So, so they're super cool. Um, let's see, what else do I want to mention on this page? Um, these are also some of my favorites. Um, and a lot of people don't realize um, water pennies are actually larval, the larval stage of the rifle beetles. Um, which are both class one, or which are class one animals, um, or group one animals here. So I love water pennies, they're really cool. We're gonna look at those on the next page. So, so yeah, so here are some of the better pictures of them. So we have our, in the upper left, we have our three-tailed um, mayfly. Um, in the bottom left, we have a caddisfly in a little stone box. It's a little perfect one. Um, in the top right, um, that's a caddisfly without his little, without a little box. Below that's a stonefly. Um, and then bottom middle, these are those water pennies. So the, they're the larva. And you can't really tell from this picture, um, but they sort of suction themselves to the rock. But if you flip them over, you can actually see their legs and everything um, underneath. So they are an insect. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that. They just, they think there's something different because they sort of suction themselves to the rock. Um, and then there are snails. We're actually gonna talk about two different types of snails. Um, snails that are in sort of this group one are our guild snails. And I'm gonna go back for a second. So if you're looking at them, the way you can identify them, if you're looking at them in like in this picture, when you hold them up, their opening is sort of on the right. There are the other snails we're gonna look at are pouch snails and they're actually a group three um, animal. They're, when you look at them, their opening is on the left. So, so. Oh, that is our snails. Apita out. <laughs> Sorry, my family's decided to join me. <laughs> All righty, group two. So those are our group one animals. Those are our really sensitive. They, you're only going to find them where it's really nice and clean. Um, group two, these guys are a little bit more tolerant. Um, they can live where it's a little bit dirty, but not as much. Um, they're not quite as sensitive. Um, I went too far. Um, those are going to be things like your crayfish, um, which are always fun to find in the stream. Um, scuds, which are, they're, they're kind of like a very small shrimp kind of animal. Um, clams, um, 
crane fly larva. Crane fry are really cool. Their larva I find completely gross. Um, and we'll still show you a bigger picture of them in a second. Um, but but they're really cool animals. So they're, once they become adults, they're those really big ones that look like giant mosquitoes um, that are flying around. Those are your crane flies. Um, so they're a fun one to see. And then some different, um, oh, sorry, completely blank there. Some different um, larvae for some beetles and things. So, so here we have some pictures of them. So we have our crayfish. Um, we have, I think this is a, um, a fisher fly or a fish fly um, larva up in the right hand corner. It might be a helger mite, but I think it's a fisher or fish fly. Um, we have that scud, those little shrimp like ones down in the bottom right. We have the, um, we have that crane fly that like I said, I think they're kind of gross looking and they can be anywhere from like two to four inches. They can get really big. Um, and then one that wasn't on that chart um, from before that I think are important too, are your damselfly and your dragonfly nymphs um, that live in the water. Those are gonna be in sort of that class two, our group two as well. So, so these guys, if you find them in the water, that's really great. Um, but if you're only finding them and not group one, then it is a sign that the water isn't as healthy as it could be. Alrighty, and then we have our group three animals. These are the guys- The call has been forwarded. They are perfectly okay to um, to live in areas that are a little bit um, a little bit dirtier. You know, they can handle some of the different pollutants. Um, and there was, I hate to say it, but there are also ones that people don't always get as ex excited about. Um, this is going to be your different fly larvae, um, your midge larvae, your aquatic worms, your leeches. Um, and then uh, there's that pouch snail that I was talking about and you can see it has the, the opening is on the left when you look at it like that. So, so not, you know, not the highest level, the cutest animals. Um, like I said, your worms, your leeches, um, you got the leech up in the left. This is um, a midge larva on the right, black flies down on the left, worms, and then our, and then our um, pouch snail down on the bottom right. Um, so these are some of the things they can live anywhere. Like, like I said, if we find them in a stream, along with you know mayflies and caddisflies and stoneflies and crayfish and all those things, then that's wonderful. So that's a perfectly healthy stream. But if we're only finding these kind of animals, if you're if you're looking and you only find 500 black flies, if but nothing else, that's not necessarily good. Even if you found a ton of them, because they can live where it's a little bit, you know, a little bit dirtier. Um, so that's not necessarily a sign that your stream is particularly healthy. Um, and that's where it leads me to my sort of last thing here. And this is something that I find really, really important to talk about when we talk about um, these categories is it's really about diversity. So when we look at them, we can talk about, you know, how many of the different things that we find, but what you really want is to find a diversity of, of animals. And the more diversity you find, the more different kinds of animals, the better quality health, the better, better quality your water probably is because that diversity is going to support more animals or the, the healthy water is going to support that diversity of animals. So it's really important to, to think about that. So, so if you go to the stream and you do a macro survey and you only find two or three different species, even if some of them are good species, that's not as good of a sign as if you go to a stream and you find 14 different species of, of macro invertebrates there. So, so just sort of different ways of, of thinking about sort of how those, what, what the message those macroinvertebrates can tell us. Alrighty, so, so these are all of the things that we're going to be doing um, in our stream monitoring program. <laughs> um, so we are in the process of putting this together right now. Um, we are recruiting volunteers. I already have a couple. I'm looking for about three to five volunteers. Um, we are doing a training um, for the volunteers in person um, so that we can go and actually look for macroinvertebrates and do the tests and so everyone can sort of see how it works. Um, we're doing it next Saturday, May 22nd, if anyone is interested. Um, and then what the commitment will probably be is um, one to two hours per month, but we're gonna be doing this year round. Um, so we wanna be able to compare seasonal differences. We wanna be able to compare hopefully eventually year to year differences in addition to sort of location differences. Um, we estimate that to do all of the testing and the macroinvertebrate will take about one to two hours for a site. Um, so we're looking for volunteers to take on different sites on the property. Um, and as I said, 
come and, and do it once a month year round, um, even when it's kind of cold. Um, so if anyone is interested, um, you can email me um, and I will send you more information about the training um, and about how that's going to work. Um, but we're really excited about this project and to see what, um, what we can learn from the, from the water on our property. And then, like I said, hopefully we're going to be able to continue to expand and then share our data with the Aquatuck Watershed Association and people who are doing chemical testing and these kind of testing on the um, Schuylkill River so that we can sort of see how it's all tied together and how what we're doing, what we have on our property impacts it. Um, and as we continue to do, you know, over the next several years, as we continue to do more repairing and buffer work and put in more native plants along our stream, you know, how does that impact um, the water. Um, so we're, I'm really excited to sort of see how we can um, use this data over the next several years. Um, there are a lot of places that you can do, um, if you're interested in doing it and you don't want to come out to us and do water monitoring with us, um, there are a lot of different places that you can do it. Um, like I said, Aquatuck Watershed does some water monitoring. Most of your watershed associations do some type of stream monitoring. So if you have a local one and you want to hook up with them, I'm sure they will be more than happy to have volunteers to help them out. Um, if you have a stream on your property and just sort of want to do it on your own, um, we are going to be putting all of our data um, with the Isaac Walton League of America, which is um, a national organization, um, and they have a national database. Um, so they're looking at sort of stream health on a much bigger picture. And we want to make sure that we're giving our data to something that's going to be can be used um, in that sort of bigger picture as well, not just for us. So this is where our data is going to be going. Um, but they have it set up so if you have a stream like on your property or in your neighborhood that you want to uh, monitor, um, they can help you with that. They've got a lot of great resources. They have some online trainings um, and they're just really, really super nice people. Um, so that's where our data is going. Um, all righty. So I talked a lot. I think this is going to be a really fun program, obviously. Um, and I think we're going to learn some really cool things from it. So I'm going to stop sharing and then see if there are any questions. Maybe, there we go. All righty, does anyone have any questions about, about the project or why we do stream monitoring or if I completely messed up one of my descriptions, which it's very possible. I, I have a question about the location of the sites uh -huh. um, for the monitoring. So where are they gonna be? Roughly. So, um, so we are looking at, and I, I have a lovely map for this, um, but we are looking at, there's an area um, that actually crosses, the, our trail crosses, our, the white trail as you're going up along our stream, um, almost to the road um, when it hits 263, if you're familiar with that area of the property, um, where a couple small streams come together. And just below that, um, there, there's a spot we've identified that's literally like right off the trail. Um, by one of the little bridges. Um, so that'll be the top one. The second one is going to be by the um, by the boulder crossing that we have, which is a, a highly used area for our education programs. Um, then we're going to um, to do near the, um, a couple of years ago, we had an Eagle Scout who built a beautiful bridge for us. And that's actually where we're doing a lot of our, um, where we started doing a lot of our um, repairing and buffer repair is in that area. So we're going to monitor there. And then we're going to monitor after the stream, um, just as it goes back into the wooded area. Um, off of the red trail. So, so those will be our four stops uh, and that we're looking for people to monitor. And like so I said, the, the fourth spot is the one I'm particularly interested in because that, you know, will tell us a lot about the impact of the pond. So as you go yes. down the red trail, it's just kind of going to just hang a left and go down the hill and find a spot down there. Pretty much as soon as you can do it. There, there's a lot of vegetation before that. And we decided that probably wasn't fair to volunteers to make them weed through all of that briars and stuff. So we waited and we're, we're going to choose a spot as soon as it goes into the woods. Okay. So, so yeah, so it, like I said, it should be interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious in a couple of years to be able to sort of report back, you know, what we're finding and, and how, how we can compare it. So, all right. Any other questions? All right. If you know anyone who's interested in volunteering, send them my way. Or if you're interested in volunteering, let me know. Alrighty, then I think we are great. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, I love doing these programs. Um, again, if you're interested or know anyone else who might be interested, this um, recording will go up on YouTube probably in a couple of days. Um, so you can feel free to share it or watch it again. Um, and then 
just sort of have fun. And then next week, as I said, um, is all about butterflies and our butterfly count. Um, then we're wrapping up. So it's been, it's been a very fun series. All right, if no one has any other questions, um, I will say goodbye to everybody. Thank you, Stacey, very informative. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. You did fine on the chemistry. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I figure if I stayed a little general, we'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you all and have a great day.